Welcome to the session um, on Spring Helios Hypermedia APIs with Spring. My name is Oliver Drotbom. I work for Pivotal. Um, working with my colleague Greg Turnquist on the Spring Helios libraries. Greg unfortunately can't be here today, um, which is especially unfortunate because of literally a lot of stuff that I am going to show you in the session today uh, is his work. And um, yeah, let's get started right away. As I said, um, I'm an engineer in the Spring Engineering team. Been probably mostly known for my work on Spring Data of the past decade, and uh, sort of have handed over the project lead of uh, project lead role of that um, to the colleague Mark Paluch recently, allowing me to focus on that kind of stuff. Uh, if you see my talk before on mon monolith, um, slightly different focus, but still part of the data team though. So. What's the Spring Data Project in the first place, right? So that's sort of the mission statement of um, the project. We are sort of trying to help you build hypermedia-based REST web services, which is a bit like repeating yourself, right? A real REST, REST web service is hypermedia-based, at least according to Fielding. And I don't want to actually get into a discussion whether that's something worth pursuing or not. I mean, we will, we will get there. Uh, so, debating whether something is restful or not is entirely not the point, right? Either your kind of your application is benefiting from the traits that in uh, uh, the REST architectural style gives you, or it's not. And if you think it is, then you might want to implement it. And we're sort of uh, trying to make that as easy as possible because, uh, surprise, surprise, it's not really supported. The hypermedia aspect of uh, REST as architectural style is not really well supported in different. Uh, web frameworks, actually, right? And so I basically started the project, um, what is it? It should be almost a decade ago, even, uh, when I was working in a consultancy for Spring Source, and we were having customers that were implementing REST web services, and we were doing quite a bit of hypermedia already. And I found myself repeatedly taking the same code over and over again from customer project to customer project. And then we sort of de-customerized that code and turned it into what um, has become, I think, the project with the longest incubation time uh, ever because we just like went uh, 1.0 a couple of weeks ago um, because there's been a, quite a few refinements along the ways. And uh, also a Spring Data project, Spring Data REST, has significantly shaped what's available in Spring Hate US because uh, that's also using hypermedia elements in, in the APIs it produces. And uh, we just didn't want to like cage the functionality in Spring Data REST because it's useful for Spring MVC applications as well. All right. So who of you has heard of hypermedia before? Oh, that's a couple. So I have to do this for the recording then. Um, so what is this hypermedia thing even? What, what's, what's, what's that fuzz about, right? Um, so the idea is that you start with some representation. Let's say, when I say JSON, I, I mean usually mean this kind of like, it doesn't have to be JSON, right? It could be XML, but we, we will see a lot of JSON today. Uh, you start with some JSON document that sort of carries a couple of uh, properties of your application data, right? Uh, so let's say we, we deal with orders here. The examples will be about orders and payments and what have you. We'll see that in a bit. But there's application level data inside that JSON document, right? And the hypermedia aspect of uh, REST actually says that you're not only shipping data to it, but also ship instructions or information about uh, the resources state in form of hypermedia elements to uh, the client. Uh, I'm using a format called HAL here. Um, you see there's a links, underscore links block and underscore embedded block. Let's see whether we get to discuss the latter one, but the format basically just contains links in the first play, place. Just like you, when you browse a web page, you go to amazon.com, you're not like just only seeing the data of a book, right? It's author, uh, it's a t table of contents or what have you. You also get handles to do something with the book. You can add it to your card, you can uh, get other related books listed and what have you. So these hypermedia elements can roughly be um, differentiated into two different buckets, right? Static hypermedia elements, which is uh, re related resources in the first place. So the order always 
is placed by a customer, right? So we can put the, a link to the customer into uh, the representation. And the other um, aspect here is static um, IANA link relations, like the self-relation technical link relations, right? Something that helps you identifying the document if you take it out of context and later on have to inspect it for some reason. Um, right, so that's, that's the, the, two, uh, the two things seen over here, right? These ones. And they make, they make up what, what hypermedia is about in the first place, right? So basically the, the ability to point to other documents, uh, so basically exceeding the current document's purpose by uh, being pointed to, to other related resources. That's some kind of the static approach. But in Fielding's thesis, um, we, he doesn't only talk about hypermedia, but hypermedia as the engine of application state. And the question what, is, what, what does that even mean? Well, it means that the links are not even, or clients that interact with these links should actually not assume that they are static, right? So don't write a client that assumes that a customer link is always present, or at least build it in a way that it can deal with the fact that the, that customer link is not, is not here. So while you could argue that a customer not being present in the representation is a bit of a weird thing, right? Because the order has to be assigned to or has to be placed by a customer in the first place. But there are other things that this kind of conditionality sort of allows you, um, which is first and foremost that certain aspects of the resource's state can be expressed by that, right? And then you're pretty quickly at the, at the topic of state machines, right? The, the, a resource as a state machine. And then you sort, that sort of starts to shape you, your thinking about the world, like an order being placed. So it's in a certain state, and only in that state it can be paid, and uh, it can be canceled, or it can be suspended, it could have been shipped. It has different states, right? Different stages it's, it's going through in its life cycle. And the presence or non-presence of the links basically indicates what the next available states are. So you can't really necessarily judge from the presence or non-presence of the links what state it is in particular, but you, you basically interact uh, with, with the resource based on what can I currently do with it, right? So let's say um, I've just removed the, the customer link there uh, and replaced it with a payment one. So I'm not saying it, the customer one is gone, it's just, just to focus here on, on a side deck. So the payment link would only appear if the order can be paid right now, right? And this gives you a pretty decent or interesting handle, actually, if you think it through, that um, whether the order can be paid is totally encoded on the server side, right? It's not even leaking into the client because the client can just, it's just blindly following link there, yes, then do something. Link not there, then do, uh, not do something, right? Present something. And I'll show you, the, I show you a couple of examples uh, uh, in a bit. Uh, how the, how the client, or we can actually change the client's behavior by um, ch changing the server, the server implementation only. Right. So this is this infamous hypermedia as the engine of application state, right? We're trying to get the client to, um, to only follow the link relations and then sort of make sense of them. And if I'm coming back to the example of um, uh, you browsing a web page, right? There's some factor that we sort of have, we don't have here, which is a human being sitting in front of a screen knowing what add, add to cart actually means and what it means or what, what the consequences are when you actually push that button. Right? And we're going to discover how that actually works. How can ma machines make actually sense of payment? What, what is payment? That's some kind of, it's, it's an English word, right? We as humans understand, but to a machine it's just an arbitrary string, basically. And we have to actually put some semantics behind it. All right, so now that we've got the technicalities out of the way, we can argue why would you actually want to equip your JSON payloads with hypermedia information? I mean, in my obviously contrived example, it, the, the hypermedia elements took more room than the actual data, but I mean, that was just consequence of me basically collapsing that uh, line items um, node there. And I, I briefly touched on this already, which is um, that by keeping the, the actual business knowledge that might 
undergo certain changes because like people from uh, from your your business basically decide okay we have certain policies about payment there's certain policies about cancellation and those might change and by keeping them on a the server we can actually um, change uh, the application sorry for that um, change the application um, much more, much more, much more freely, actually. So I've, I've brought. I mean, if you've seen hypermedia-related presentations of mine before, I've again brought the Restbox example uh, implementation of a uh, Starbucks coffee ordering experience that takes an order through these different states. Again, I said uh, state machine is sort of something that that that, or at least it looks like a, a state machine, right? And the particular focus here being on. Um, the uh, cancellation policy for now, right? So the, the business has decided that as soon as you have paid for your order, you cannot cancel the thing anymore, right? And if you now imagine or trying to implement that, uh, that API, or an API for that without hypermedia elements, there's no real way to communicate to the client to um, when it is allowed to present uh, like some, some button or something to actually cancel uh, the order uh, without sort of replicating the knowledge about the different states into the into the client right and that creates coupling because if you want to change something about it we have to uh, we have to both change the server and the client right? uh, sample project is on github uh, you can find that and i'm going to show you a quick demo where we basically proceed from that state of our business process quote unquote to a new state where uh, business has decided that Hey, well, we might be uh, we might want to uh, allow the cancellation of the order um, later at a later stage of the life cycle of the order without even restarting the client. So, I, I, what I've what I've uh, brought with me is a admittedly very amateurish um, Android application that's running here, and you see uh, I have the Restbox application running. And it has created three orders just by initialization. And if you, excuse me, this is, this is German because my um, machine is um, German uh, local, uh, as German local settings. And uh, the, the API has basically, um, has internationalization features built in here. So if you just inspect an, an, an order, you get to enter your credit card number and uh, could issue a payment, right? You can cancel the order. That's basically the, the, the what was it, a state transition three or something. You could go back to the overview or refresh this view. Just let me go back here. And you see for the one that's already been like paid and prepared, uh, it says just ready for pickup and uh, it's basically yeah, in an, in an end state, quote unquote. Right. So the the important bit being here that um, the uh, that the cancel button is gone, right? So the code, the the uh, the Kotlin code in of this Android application has basically. I can actually even show you this uh, if I just find it real quick. Uh, Java uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Uh, order details activity. There should be a rest box cancel, right? So. If I give my ignorance on IntelliJ, I'm not an IntelliJ user. Um, so there's some code in here that basically uh, issues an HTTP request to the resource, and then there's uh, API here that w which you can just use that way. You say, okay, express if the link relation, yada yada yada, is present, then go ahead, enable the button, and if the button is pressed, uh, issue the cancel link, and um, that probably shouldn't be a get request, right? Oh no, that's not a get request. That's just a uh, the a future, basically a, um, an asynchronous invocation, so that the request is happening on a on a different thread. So that's just waiting for that to to actually conclude, right? And then uh, it's just uh, redirecting us back to the to the uh, main activity, right? So that's kind of that's the, the client doesn't actually know about anything about why whether the um, uh, whether the order is cancelable, it just says, okay, if it's, it's allowed to cancel, then uh, I provide the, the UI element. So let's go ahead and basically change that because there's API on the server um, that uh, is built that way. And 
it is conditionally adding the cancel link, right? So it's using, it is now, no, it knows about the, the order state and can basically implement the business rule like this. If the order is paid, then uh, if it's not paid, then present the cancel link or there's even an update link relation which we don't any, do anything about it. So if I change that um, to move that out of the if clause and uh, sort of unconditionally add the cancellation uh, link, then I can just go back here to the overview, and then I can go back in here, and it's now available to cancel, right? So we can hide an entire like business policy change behind the f behind uh, just like that literal uh, uh, request or, or what is it? A link is available or is not available. I didn't even have to restart the thing. Just imagine if, you, if all of this was encoded in the, in the client, you'd, for, you'd have to ship a new release of that thing. It has to go through the app stores, what have you, how, how long it would actually take to get that into your user's hands. Um, all right. So it, bottom line, gist of the story is you, you're, you'll be able to change things about your domain much quicker. Um, and you can actually um, adhere to, or it, it, that, it, it gives you more flexibility in terms of the way your API can actually evolve. So we've done that. All right, so what are the Spring Hadoos bits and pieces that are in play here, or that, that are, what would actually, even stepping away from the example, uh, what are the, the parts of the, uh, the library that actually, or what kind of support do you get? Let's phrase it like this. So there's like four ma major areas. One is representation models, links and affordances, media type support, and uh, we have a bit of client side support and I have a um, tiny an announcement to make, not really an announcement, but something I'd like you to look at and potentially get involved with. So let's start with representation models. Um, there, so if you, if you take a step back and think about the, the JSON document I showed you in the first place about that order, right? Getting Jackson to serialize an order class or an instance of an order class is pretty simple, right? Um, if you now go ahead and, and uh, decide or ask yourself what, what are you supposed to do when you want to add links to that representation, um, you'd sort of come up with some wrapper or decorate, uh, decoration of that order that allows you to add those links. And that's exactly what we had uh, in the O.X timeline was a, a class called resource support. It's basically a, a container around a list of links which you could add links to and remove links from, right? So just basically, uh, so, so that you can, in your Spring MVC controller, you can write code to, ex, to actually do that. Um, we had dedicated support for different types of resources. If you've read the book um, uh, Rest, Restful Patterns or Rest Patterns or something like that, uh, the author, uh, I forgot his name unfortunately, speaks about like two different, uh, different kinds of resources. Uh, two of them, two classical ones being a so-called collection resource which returns a list of things, right? So it represents a list of things. So something like customers, uh, we abstracted that in a, in a dedicated wrapper type. So you, you come ahead, come, let's say you use a Spring Data repository, get a list of customers returned, and then you, you just use your resources class and add the, uh, add the list to it as the content, and then you basically get it, get it um, rendered properly, right? Um, and item resources is basically just like a single customer for example, and the type for that was resource. Is anyone, does anyone, um, is, is there something remarkable about, about the, the types or the names of the types, anyone? Is that correct? Well, customers, oh yeah, it should be customers in the bottom, but I think it's just the wrong term because what you're abstracting is not the resource you're building a representation model, right? And that's, I mean, the very top hint at it. And we, I've, I've been bothered by that for a long time, and I shied away from changing it to representation model, uh, to actually this, um, because this can easily get out of hand, because if you have a collection representation model of entity representation models of customer, then your generics declaration um, becomes a bit uh, involved, Unfortunately, we have uh, diamond operators and var um, 
the var keyword in, in recent Java versions, so that sort of gets mitigated, and we actually fix that for the, for the 1.0 uh, thing. Um, there's a couple of other, speaking of the migration to 1.0, there's a couple of other things that we, where we fixed names and uh, reorganized packages and whatnot. There is a, a script available in the Spring Hatios repo that you can just like run on your um, Spring Hatios 0.25, I think, uh, application that will just take care of all the renames and all the, the imports so that, that most of uh, your, your client code should be able to, to be migrated with, with that. All right. Representation models. So basically, what, the idea fundamentally is that there is some, there's some domain API, basically some hypermedia domain API that allows you to prepare these representation models and later on we have to decide like what actual media type we want to produce and then this canonical representation model is actually translated into, into a particular media type like hell or what have you. All right, so we have the representation model classes. Let's go on to, to links. Um, there is just a very simple and fundamental API to actually create links, right? So if you just went to, want to go ahead in your controller and say new link, here is my target, here is my link relation. So uh, if you avoid the link relation, you get a, uh, get a self -relay, uh, a link relation and, um, or you can specify it directly. So it's very, very, um, very low level link creation. Um, However, if you like working with Spring MVC controllers, you of course don't want to b keep track and, uh, of all the, I mean, the, the host could even change, right? If you want to use um, um, absolute URIs, for example, or the mappings could change, you don't want to replicate them. So you'd rather, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, you rather uh, want to point to controller uh, methods, but this is something I'm, uh, that's, I'm, going, I'm going to talk about in a bit. Um, what's also pretty helpful and needed at some points is um, URI templates, in other words, links that contain placeholders. So there is the uh, specification for that um, that basically defines path variables, it defines uh, query parameters, optional query parameters, non-optional query parameters, all these kinds of things. Um, and there's API for you, for you to, uh, to, to create these links and then I think the, the meat is in the, in the second assertion. Basically it parses out the parameters so you can interact with the parameters. You can take this link and add new parameters programmatically. Um, yeah, especially if you're working with stuff like that on the client side. If, so if you're receiving a JSON document that maybe is using uh, URI templates, you can actually easily access those. Get to that in a second. Uh, yeah, this is basically parameter uh, or link expansion. You prefer, uh, prepare a, a map of the parameters and then you expand them and then you see how they actually, how they get um, expanded. All right, so getting back to the controller thing, right? So assuming you have a, um, uh, in this case, very simple, very cruddy even um, a person controller, one pointing as you see, a collection resource and one sort of mimicking a, a, an item resource, that, that show method here is interesting. You might want to create a link by saying, um, dear link, point to the show method with the path, with the person uh, variable pointed or uh, expanded to two, for example, right? And you can do that. There's API for that in, in Spring HTS. Um there's the web MVC link builder in, it's, I think it's called controller link builder in, uh, in the 0.25 uh, area. We've sort of added support for Spring Web Flux in the 1.0 release and then decided to sort of make it uh, a sort of symmetrical. Uh, web MVC link builder and uh, Web Flux link builder are available there. So you basically say link2, so link2 is a static method on web MVC link builder, and then there's a method on person controller show dot 2L, uh, like a two. And what that does is it basically creates a proxy for the person controller class uh, to record the method invocation and extract the, the parameters that are then used to expand uh, the link template that you have on your at request mapping annotation. There's similar for support for that in, in Spring MVC itself. It's just not, the, the support in MVC doesn't know about the concept of a link, so the, the uh, combination with a 
um, with a link relation, right? So, um, yeah, there's a, there's a, it, the, the support in, in MVC was introduced uh, uh, quite a bit later on than, than we had this stuff around, so that's basically a simplified version of that. But yeah, it allows you to, to point to um, yeah, person controller or general uh, controller methods. All right, so let's go on to affordances. So what's this affordance in the first place? Uh, in fact, like the hypermedia elements that you've seen in the, uh, uh, in the introductory example are some kinds of affordances in the first place. So it's basically traits of an, of an object that sort of make obvious what you can do with it uh, without needing any further uh, um, instruction or what have you. If you have your cup of tea, right, it has this kind of handle that sort of, even if you don't know that you can actually pick it up on that, you just sort of do because there's some, some natural connection uh, going on here. Um, and the, uh, the 1.0 release actually adds support for uh, hypermedia types that work with affordances uh, quite a bit. So I, let me, let me, or let's get, uh, get over with the, with the foundations here and then into an example that probably uh, resolves all of this. Um, we have a, a dedicated type here. Let me try to see if I can navigate you through this. So that's a dedicated type. It's just a, a value object, basically, that is used as the payload or to map the payload for the for the request body of that put operation. So we're we're expressing we're we're intending to receive put requests that actually take a JSON document with a credit card number as in its number field, right? That's so far so obvious, right? And this is, this is, pretty, this is kind of expressed on the, uh, um, on the method level. So we can, you could argue that a lot of the metadata that you need to describe what's going on here, dear client, if you send a put request to that, you need a name parameter that has to conform to certain uh, credit card number requirements is all derivable and inspectable from, uh, from this method declaration, just like we've done with the, with the controller or with the WebMVC link builder, but in which we just only focused on the, on the, on the actual mapping. But there's actually more information in here that we, that we can derive. Right. So um, what we added in 1.0 is the ability to add this kind of affordance metadata to a link. So you basically go ahead and say, okay, I have a link that points to something. And by the way, there, is, there are different other methods that are sort of mapped to the, to the same, I mean, it could be the very same method or it could be other methods, uh, other controller methods that carries additional meta, metadata that uh, you might want to just capture and then actually serialize in a certain hypermedia format. Um, I hope this, make, this is going to make sense in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, Right, so the, the point here being the additional metadata can also can be picked up or analyzed in the very same way that we've just uh, created the, the sole links in the first place. Um, you can also create these affordances uh, the, or these, this affordance metadata uh, manually. So let's say we have a, um, an employee controller. This is probably the example I should have started with. But... Um, Let's say there is an employee controller uh, with a method, it's basically slash employees, and it, um, there's a get mapping for it to return all of the, uh, the uh, employees that are available in the system, and a post mapping that is uh, basically used to create uh, um, new employees. And you can sort of describe that, even if it wasn't a, a Spring MVC controller, but you can describe that by, by this kind of fluent API, um, and like the f I think the first one is obvious, right? So there's like input and output. There's a, just a shortcut for that. So it takes an employee DTO and the result will be an employee DTO as well because there are certain media types that also allow you to, de to describe which of the fields or that are returned uh, have which characteristics and whatnot. And on the input side for the get method, we uh, have optional query parameters so that you can filter on both name and role. And both of these affordances get a name. One gets the name created, one gets the search name, and then um, this is, um, there's the final to link. And that thing then can get, 
added to a representation model. Right? So we, we've added the link. So if you just render a standard HAL document that doesn't know anything about affordances, it will only render the link. If you're rendering some some a media type that is capable of expressing these, this affordance metadata, adding these calls will actually cause that additional data to be included in the, in the response. I, I bet this, this is going to all materialize in a second if we then talk about different media types. So what, I mean, what does the support for media type in Spring, um, Spring Hagios look like? We have this canonical representation model that's usually uh, media type agnostic. Um, there are certain extensions for each media types in which like if you want to use that special feature of that particular media type, you can do that, but the, the fundamental uh, um, implementation is media type agnostic. Um, there is mostly Jackson, a, a Jackson module uh, behind the rendering, and that makes a particular Jackson output. For media types that actually support affordances, there's also an affordance model factory. Um, like whenever you call this kind of afford method on yada, 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 then we sort of take that method and hand that to all the affordance model factories um, known to Spring Hedios, and they can then use, inspect the method and, and inspect all the, all the different aspects for uh, the exact, the type of information they actually allow you to express, right? Different media types uh, allow you to do different things and um, so each media type basically can can get active as kind of a kind of a plug-in system. Here. All right, let's try to make more sense of that uh, using an HAL forms example, right? So we start with our representation model. So there's this entity uh, resource model. It should be entity representation model, of course. Typo, massive typo. Um, so we put we put our order into the uh, entity representation model, and then we uh, go ahead and add a link to the payment um, uh, to the payment uh, controller method. Right? There's some some controller method saying payment controller submit payment. Uh, that's where the where the ellipsis is. There we we just put it in there and then add the link there. That results in the link being included in the representation. Right? I'm using some kind of special notation there. Restbox colon payment. I get back to that in a second. So the question is, I mean, that gives us a lot, right? So we can, this is basically the, everything you've seen in the demo before, uh, or the, the aspect that I was focusing on there, is, is basically, this is enough for actually to implement the, the stuff you've seen before. Um, what you now have to inc encode in the client and have to, in this case, also compile into the client is, how the client is supposed to interact with the resource that link points to, right? Which HTTP method it's supposed to use, which fields it's supposed to send, what format those fields have to be, and none of this is obvious from, from this point on, right? So what, what can we do about this? What it, I mean, everything beyond that is what affordances are all about. So the first thing we do for HAL and HAL forms is uh, we add a so-called query provider and basically tell it, okay, um, there's this magic rest box thing. You've seen that in my rest box colon uh, payment uh, uh, link that I've created. And I'm defining um, a URI template uh, that points to some, some, some arbitrary resource. And that adding that uh, query provider to the Spring application context causes an additional link to be rendered named queries. And this is something that's actually HAL specific and tells you the following. Dear client, if you want to know more about any of the links, right, you find documentation about the links, um, add a particular URI, and that basically applies to all the links starting with RESTbox. So the documentation or the, what we've done here is that we've um, sort of agreed to under slash docs slash payment deploy um, some kind of information that the client can use, right? And from then on, it's again 
content negotiation. So if the client understands a particular format, I mean, you have to tell the sort of tell it upfront, like what kind of media type you want you want to provide, right? Whether it's Alps or Hal Forms in this case. But the client can then go ahead and just take that local name of the link, expand the link, uh, the link template below, and then uh, issue a request to that, and basically use the metadata that's coming back from there. So that's what the client what what the client is doing, and we just like issue a get request to docs slash payment, and then we get back that um, in this case it's half forms it uh, provides you that underscore templates thing and says, okay, we need to use put, and we need to provide a field named number. So, um, where does that information come from? Again, we've, we've added this affordance to the, uh, uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the example before, where we basically said, okay, here's the link to the submit payment um, uh, controller method, and it inspects that, uh, Spring Haters inspects that, sees there's a put mapping, and it sees there's an add request body and analyzes the payment form uh, type for its properties so that it basically uh, um, yeah, just lists in, in a JSON format what, what kind of metadata is exposed there. Right. For form details, the request body. Right. So the, the issue we now still have is that a credit card number, I mean, so far it, we only had number uh, the, the only information available was we need a single field named number. And by default, I think HAL forms assumes a string property of some sorts, which sort of makes sense that it comes from the, from the uh, um, what is it, from the, like, HTML forms only submit strings in the first place, like raw strings in the first place. So it's not in, not, not in implying any kind of restriction on the actual format of the field, right? But our domain class credit card number definitely has that, and um, in the example we've, we'll see that in a bit. Uh, it's basically a regex expression, making sure that the credit card number is 16 digits long. So it's nothing more than that. And we can actually, I mean, that's, as credit card number is a domain object, um, that's, that logic is sort of implemented in there. So if you try to create a credit card number instance, it will be rejected if it's uh, like shorter or longer than 16 characters. But that information is not really available from the, it's not inspectable from the outside world. And there's two ways to actually uh, solve that problem. One is you can use an, uh, just a Java X validation uh, annotations on the type, so you can just add an add pattern on credit card number. Um, I'm not a big fan of using these validation annotations on domain types. If it's dedicated types, that's fine, but in this case, we just like stick with the domain type. And with for that, you can just like tell the HAL forms configuration, dear HAL forms, whenever you find a credit card number type, consider this particular uh, pattern for that. Uh, for that type. Right? So in, in, for any kind of like formatted values, that's kind of a way to from the outside actually um, add that. And that piece of configuration would then have the, an additional field regex uh, appear in health forms. And if you now went ahead to actually build a client that given that regex field is available in the form, it could um, apply the validation like right on the client, right? So you basically send it the, the rules. And if you change the rules on the server, basically make it the 16 digits, 14 digits, then the client would automatically pick that up because it's just picking up the, uh, the regex and um, um, using that. So back to my demo overview. Yep. So let's go to a... Um, to an order to be paid. And this is the state where we, we haven't defined that uh, regular expression yet, or we haven't exposed that, that, um, that constraint yet. So I can just like type in anything here, and it will just like allow me to, you see the, the payment button is, uh, is still active. I, can, I should even be able to send this away and then have probably the app uh, throw an exception down here saying it's invalid credit card number. Right, so it's 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 not it's rejecting it right from the credit card numbers constructor. So um, 
if I go ahead and then enable that, uh, that pattern here, I can just, uh, so it, it does it, so it's, it's not been paid. And if I start uh, typing now, you see invalid credit card number. And that's because the client has always been prepared to use that regex field from, the, uh, from that forms document, right? So there's an, a basically a separate meta information um, that the client uses to build the form in the first place. So the client is loading the health forms thing and then basically, oh, there needs to be a, a text field named, uh, what is it, number? And then it just puts up this, this field here. So the, the sole existence of that field is driven by the health forms. Uh, let me complete this real quick. Uh, yay, works. Complete it. Finish processing, refresh, ready for pickup. Yay. And I can still cancel it um, because we've changed that before. So again, we are kind of keeping a lot of, I mean, I could, there's just other things that, everything that you can express in the health forms document can be changed by a sole change of the server implementation, basically. Uh, that, that's the point here. All right. Um, what you've seen here is uh, the, the rec health forms recommended way of interacting with the forms. Uh, health forms as a format is entirely compatible with HAL. So there's, it would even, or it's even possible to just like add this underscore templates um, field to an existing HAL document and be done with it. Uh, health forms itself still recommends that way via the queries, right? Whether the, uh, by the, uh, the way to inspect a separate resource that contains the meta information. So there's like two approaches, um, the two approaches have different, different pros and cons. Basically the inline resource uh, avoids the additional requests, right? We don't have to inspect the query and issue that uh, request to docs uh, slash form. We would just, if, it, if the template was part of the original resource uh, representation, then we could just like outright use it. Um, however, uh, the reason you might not want to do that is that the metadata and the actual entity data has usually very different life cycles. And the, the uh, approach of a separate resource for the documentation for the form specification allows you to put much stronger um, like caching, requ caching specifications on it. So you, you can literally cache this thing to death, basically, unless you assume changes, right? You don't have to repeatedly uh, transmit the form metadata if nothing changes at all, right? You don't, um, uh, yeah, separate resource, or oh, this way around. Yeah, you have to do additional requests. Um, but uh, have forms sort of, uh, I think the original author of, of HAL, Mike, uh, he indicated that the, uh, th th it was one of the reasons that the health form specification did not include anything forms like in the first place was that, because he thought it should be a different, different representation on a different resource anyway because of that cacheability story. Um, and health forms sort of aligned with that. It just like took the, Mike too, just took the time to, to write, this, write this up. But both uh, approaches are, very, uh, very, are, are fine um, and both are supported by, by the, the APIs that we expose here. So um, we've always supported HAL and ALPS. Uh, ALPS is application level profile semantics. It's kind of a, um, it's similar to, to HAL forms. Um, and uh, in, in the way it, that it uh, describes the fields of payloads and also the state transitions that, um, that you can make for, for a certain resource. Um, it's a bit of a wild beast because it sort of tries to decouple even from HTTP to some degree. It's, so there's not like, okay, request method get is supported, but item potent requests are supported on that thing and it's kind of like um, it's a bit of a bit of a 
weird beast in the first place, but pretty helpful. Um, it's out of the box supported by Spring Data REST. So if you're using Spring Data REST, you get Alps metadata exported for the resources you expose there. And um, I know of a couple of like companies that actually have built decent UIs on, on top of that. Um, yeah, speaking of Spring Data REST, oh, in 1.0, we actually, and that's basically where most of the time of Greg went is the, the implementation of these different um, media types, uh, how forms the combination. And there's a media type called Uber, um, also by Mike Amundsen and one of uh, Collection Jason. So we're my, big Mike Amundsen fans, as you can probably guess from that. Um, yeah, so they, they are supported. We have requests for JSON LD. Uh, and JSON API. Um, I think there's an implementation for JSON API already. It's just not made it into into the core um, uh, core library. We're kind of like um, not sure yet about like which of which support for which uh, media types to include with Spring Hadios. But and this is this is where I like try to um, want to sort of end up on um, in a bit is it's pretty easy to just like roll your own, right? And this is what we're probably going to start to recommend uh, in the, uh, for now. Um, there is a hypermedia mapping information interface that you can just implement and declare a bean in your Spring application context and that will sort of get you rolling. So you just declare which media, what's the name of your me the media type or if, if it's got multiple ones. And then the, simp the, mo the easiest way is to just like provide a Jackson module with all the Jackson serializers and deserializers. Um, so you would only need to override one of the two lower methods. Uh, just override the, the third one, basically, uh, in case you have handler instantiators or something like that to register. If you w need to create your own object mapper or configure your object mapper entirely, then uh, there's a bit more flexibility, but some of the the media types only uh, need that, that Jackson customization. If the media type is uh, has the notion of forms or affordances in general, you'd also have to implement an affordance model factory, which should let you realize that, or the way that we sort of produce that metadata, it sort of it, it reads like a description of. Uh, Spring MVC controller method, right? There's some there's some name of the affordance, which is by default in our case the method name. Uh, there's some base link that affordance gets attached to, and then there's an HTTP method. There's input metadata, there's output metadata, and there's a couple of query parameters that you can that you can describe there. Right? So you're, you're not like in your implementation of a um, of your affordance model factory, you're not actually inspecting a method, right? So you're not getting the uh, HTTP, uh, the, the controller method given because uh, there might be like different ways you, you want to come up with the affordance model. All right, so you, to get those working, you need to register them as uh, Spring Factories. That's basically the, the reason for that is that we, the, the API uses like a static factory uh, builder method and um, we didn't want to deal with like inject something first and then call this a forward on. Uh, it, it feels like a bit like the slightly more convenient API paradigm. So we just configure those. There's if if you need some inspiration for that, uh, the, I can I can rec recommend the Health Forms one. We have a bit of time. And before, oh, that's the client support stuff. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but still, we can do that real quick. Um, there is. Yep. If you look at the uh, Spring Hatios, uh, the Health Forms one, um, there, it's. I mean, it's it's a bit of code, but it's not too much actually. Most of the stuff is classes to represent the actual media type specific form, right? So you have a a Health Forms document there, which is basically the just the the wrapper for for all the templates. And uh, that document, woof, that document just has uh, attributes. Um, where's the link relation, page metadata? What is that? Uh, there's the templates, right? So there's different templates in there. Uh, it's basically a HAL document and, and forms template. And then you should 
actually realize, okay, there's properties in here, the HTTP method, a title, yada, yada, some internationalization stuff. But um, it doesn't have to be as complex. I think Uber is even smaller. Eh, not really. Anyway, but have a look at those. Uh, They're like decent, like the, the, the entry points are pretty, okay, here's a new Hal affordance model, a Hal forms affordance model, and then it basically goes down from there. All right. So the, this, there's been a big focus on like producing like these these uh, affordance um, affordances basically um, media types that contain forms or other uh, types of affordances. Um, there's a bit of support for for writing clients as well. Um, first and foremost, an, an abstraction we call Traversin because of uh, the fact that it's a clone of a Java script library that's been just named that way. You can just start with uh, a URI and then basically tell it to understand HAL JSON. And what you do then to sort of navigate um, a resource, it's, it's basically resource traversal in the first place. That's where the name comes from. So what that thing does here is it um, issues a GET request to localhost 8080 API. It tries to find a link named movies, and it follows that link. And in the response of that uh, resource, it actually tries to find a link called movie and then actor. And uh, you can basically give it uh, parameters. So the, um, that's the, 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 the most simple version, right? So you just define a global map of parameters that are used for, uh, for all the um, for all the found links, so to expand link templates and whatnot. Um, you can also define them individually, so you can say for this hop use this parameter and for this hop use that parameter. And it ends up in just calling two object, taking a, uh, there's a, um, a two object variant that just takes a, a type, which you can get the, the actual result of the, the actor. Um, if you'd be interested in the actor as a Java object, then you just like to object actor.class. In this case, we're fine with the name, so you can project on that, and then you just get a string back, right? Um, so that's, that's uh, kind of the thing here. Um, I've seen that in use in a couple of places uh, in a way that they're not actually accessing the resource, but only discovering the final resource and then keep the link to that in, in place and then um, basically just interact with it on uh, whenever the actual client needs that. Um, there is, if you, if I, if I, uh, I just said, let's go back here. Uh, we follow the link movies, right? That's a very generic way of phrasing it because depending on what media type the client actually returns. I mean, in this case, we're saying we're dealing with HAL JSON, but it could be any other, and the API can't really change. Um, so there's, there's got to be something that knows how to find a link named movies in the representation. And this is where the link, so-called link discoverers, come in place. Uh, in this case, we're using a specific one. And given uh, that we're dealing with a HAL link discoverer, it will allow us to actually find the link payment inside the content. And uh, that would just give us this one back, right? So that's if you if you like have to deal if you just if you know okay you're only dealing with HAL documents then you can just use that. Um, otherwise, there is a link discoverers bean registers uh, registered in the application context um, for which you can find the discoverer for a particular media type. That's actually only relevant if you if you from some piece of code need to support more than one. So one thing um, that is a bit unfortunate is that most clients these days are not really written, or most clients that benefit from hypermedia are like mobile clients, or um, at least it's not like arbitrary Java processes in which you can run Spring Framework. Um, if you write an Android application, you realize pretty quick that this stuff can unfortunately not really be used on on Android because uh, the support for, there's no support for Java Beans on Android. There is, uh, Spring Framework is hardly running on, on uh, Android. I mean, you can get it to run, but uh, I didn't manage to actually get Spring HS to fully run on it. And 
because when I was building that Android application, I was kind of looking around for HTTP client APIs for Android, for which, or which you can find a couple of ones, actually. But none of them actually supporting hypermedia pretty well. So there's this one that, one that looks pretty much like Fane, I forgot the name, unfortunately, where you pre-specify all the URIs and whatnot, which is sort of the opposite of what we're trying to do here. And so I just built the Android client, um, that Android application myself, and trying to extract a bit of code into, uh, so into reusable chunks. So basically implementing the access patterns, like you've seen be before, right? This kind of resource, if link is present, then do that and that. And um, I got a, a lot of, uh, quite a few people got interested, and uh, we decided to sort of extract that code from my, my uh, sample project and put that into a separate into a separate library called client, which is, um, I mean, every Kotlin library has to start with K, right? And client is the German word for client. So um, there's a, a guy named uh, Alexander Gilke. That's a bit ironic anyway, but for personal reasons. Um, working on this and uh, helping me to, to get this up on uh, up and running so it's it's highly experimental it's basically the code cop from from the from the Android application copied uh, out and we're trying to to make this kind of Kotlin idiomatic uh, coroutines is a, is a topic in there so basically allowing you to to write uh, the the uh, clients that interact with this kind of metadata because I mean you can you can add a lot of this stuff to the server if your client is not really using it or it's hard for client developers to use that metadata this is not going to go anywhere right and um, yeah not a not a full time project definitely but if you're interested in in that kind of stuff uh, feel free to reach out all right and with that. Um, couple of miscellaneous housekeeping things. Uh, stuff I haven't mentioned. Um, representation model assembler has been around, it's been resource assembler before. Uh, it's basically it's just some abstraction to uh, where you can, if you find yourself creating uh, representation models for a certain type, like again and again, then it's just an abstraction for you to easily just encapsulate that. Um, we've just recently added uh, internationalization support for, uh, for especially for health forms. So most of the media types come with attributes in their payloads that allow you to provide human readable prompts and Spring's um, resource bundle support nicely plays into this. So you can actually go ahead and uh, declare, I'll show you this, uh, I think I have this in here. Yeah, so you have REST messages. There's nothing in here. <clears throat> so you see, um, for example, I have a German version for the titles of the links. Um, so the order is eine Bestellung and order's title is eine Bestellung ansehen oder zeugen, yada, yada. Um, and that kind of format, that underscore links order title, there is also, um, I'm not sure I've described the forms yet. I haven't, but um, there is also ways for you to, let's say, for the payment form to actually carry uh, internationalized labels so that, again, the client can just go ahead and if there is a title on the template, then use that in your UI. So whenever someone has a, uh, his, his, his or her client set to German localization, then it would actually get that. So there's out-of-the-box support for that. Uh, link relation provider API skip over this. Um, migration skipped, as I mentioned before. And there's a couple of Kotlin extensions. I think Greg uh, worked on those as well. So especially the link builder, the WebMVC and WebFlux link builder APIs um, can be used through Kotlin in a Kotlin idiomatic way, actually. All right, that's it. Are there any questions? Yes. Go ahead. What about them? How do we configure it to work? Uh, the question is, what about relative URIs? Uh, we, I, th I don't think there is a way currently. Is there a ticket for that, for, for that already? Please go ahead and, and create one. Um, I've, I've, well, we've never really bothered to 
right? I always found the, or the reason we focused on absolute URLs in the first place is that if you start with relative ones, they only make sense in the context of the document, right? So you, you have to have additional information to make them dereferenceable. So if it's just like slash customer, then as a client, if I lose context, yeah, what do I do without, with, uh, with it, right? So that's the reason we, we always try to um, create absolute URIs and there's f uh, functionality for uh, in there that you can just enable for if you like live behind a proxy or something so that you, like your, if your APIs are externalized and, uh, or externally visible that they then turn into the right domain and port and what have you. So that this get, that gets forwarded. So if you hide your Spring HOS application behind a, a corporate proxy or something like that, and it sets the appropriate headers, then the the uh, uh, what's non-relative? Jesus, absolute. absolute. My gosh, uh, the absolute uh, links will actually uh, consider those, and you will get API dot my company dot yada yada yada. So there's. I mean, I'm always using like localhost, but of course, this is not something that you would want to end up in your in your actual APIs. But please go ahead and create a ticket if you if you want to see support for that. One more question. In 0.0, I ran into an issue where the converter beans weren't being registered with the link builder. Is that something um, that has been fixed in the new version? Um, 0.0, zero, zero or what? 1.0? 0.25? Uh, so there was, at some point, <laughs> let's agree on that, uh, some converter beans were not registered. Um, I think, there, I, I, think as, uh, I remember that, I, I can think of the ticket that you're referring to. There is a, in, in some place we still use a static uh, conversion service instance that doesn't know about like registered converters. And getting rid of that is a bit tricky because the APIs to create links is a static one. And there's no way for us to properly find the right application context for us to find the converters in to actually do that. So um, I'm basically kind of procrastinating the ticket for, or have been for a while. Uh, but I think we, we have to get back to that. So it's, it's, it's not solved in 1.0 yet. So go ahead. Uh, so the question is, what about the JSON API uh, uh, extension? There's a ticket in the in the tracker. If you just go to the GitHub page, uh, someone created it. Someone uh, asked for whether we would. I think it's even a pull request, but we decided to because it came very late in the release candidate phase. We decided not to include it yet. Um, but yeah, you should you should find it on the tracker and then reach out, help, or just add your vote to include it out of the box. That I'd be fine with that as well. I, I can see that being popu very popular because I've seen it. See it. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of client, uh, like Angular and whatnot, they can actually deal with it out of the box. So um, I guess we have to ship it at some point. It's just that I know too little about that particular media format, and I don't want to like, take over code that I then have to fix bugs in for stuff that I don't really know anything about. So one more question. Question is: Is there um, a possibility to add to inject HAL forms into an options request? So I'd have to look at whether option requests are allowed to carry responses in the first place, like response bodies. That's the, the first question. So always look up in the HTTP spec. Um, I mean, you could you could just I think write an HTTP uh, Spring MVC controller method to an. I'm not sure there is an add options mapping meta annotation, but you can always fall back to add request mapping and then options and then do what I've just shown you. So it's, I mean, it's just like, it's basically just an object that you produce in your MVC controller that's then rendered via Jackson and whether, I mean, there's nothing, no HTTP method preventing it, that from happening, right? It's kind of like, yeah. If it doesn't work, create a ticket. It should definitely work. I'm not saying it's valid. Uh, I'd have to investigate that, but I don't have an opinion on that either. So, all right. 
If that's it, one more question, final one. Uh, Spring Boot, so the question is one, when dot will 1.0 go to start.spring.o? Yeah. Or uh, it, it's part of Spring Boot 2.2. So if you, uh, I mean, it's, it's going to be GA in what, two weeks or something? At least that's what we've been told. Um, uh, the, 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 I mean, Spring Data uh, Moore, the Moore release chain is already on it. And I think Spring Boot has already upgraded. So you might even see this in, if you choose the release candidates, Spring, uh, Spring Boot 2.2 release candidate on start.spring.io, you should actually already get the version and then, um, yeah, probably break a bit of client code that you already have. But the migration script, if you, if you I mean, we're not sure we have touched all the, uh, all the, the, the renamings and whatnot. So if you have feedback about the migration script, that would be highly appreciated. We could, I can definitely see us shipping improvements there. But Where are the migration scripts live? Um, in the repo, actually. It's just, oh yeah, I can recommend, uh, there's a Chrome extension for HAL forms, as we're in Nuggets time. That just, I mean, there's a couple of them that, that display Jackson uh, or Jason in, uh, in pretty decent form, but this one has this cool feature here. Uh, where you can uh, just type in stuff here. And I think if I reload the document, it should even, it has the regex in there and it does all the validation right right in place. So there's, it's not even a, uh, you don't even need a, see this? Uh, you don't even need a, a custom client to actually play with the form, which is kind of, kind of neat and helpful. Yeah. <coughs> Um, maybe as we have still four minutes, uh, the plans for the future maybe still. Uh, next step is uh, we ship with uh, with uh, adding health form support to Spring Data REST is big on our on our roadmap, and then also we uh, we have this uh, HAL Explorer or something like a JavaScript application that inspects HAL metadata and gives you some kind of UI for your let's say documentation of your API, and adding the health form support for that. Uh, will be basically the next steps. Additional media types, probably um, getting around rough edges that we, I'm, I'm pretty sure there are still tiny bugs or unsupported things in the media types that we already shipped support for, uh, but uh, we're going to straighten that out for in the, in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. All right, then enjoy the rest of the conference. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.